it must have been quite something when you realised, oh wow, the Einstein field equations can actually drop out of this. What did that feel like when you realised that? It was wonderful. I mean, it was... Again, it's not entirely surprising because, as I mentioned in relation to that more metaphysical question before, the Einstein field equations are not super contrived. At least the vacuum field equations are, if you like, the, they're the simplest constraints that you could imagine imposing on a Riemannian structure. And we already knew kind of that hypergraphs more or less behave like Riemannian manifolds, at least some class yeah. of them do in some appropriate limit. Yeah. And so it wasn't overly surprising that, that, that there should be some fairly limited set of restrictions you can, you can make that would give you the Einstein field equations. Yeah. And effectively, my methodology was to kind of work backwards. It was to say, well, we know sort of what the discrete version of the Einstein-Hilbert action would look like. What kind of condition would that translate to on the hypergraphs? Oh, look, it turns out it's actually just the restriction that the dimension is not diverging yeah. off to infinity. And then, okay, to really make that analytically rigorous, you need to impose causal invariance and weak ergodicity. But really, the heart of it is as long as the hypergraph is growing in such a way that the dimension is not growing without bound, yeah. as long as that is the case, and as long as a continuum limit exists and is, and is well-defined, then the Einstein field equations are kind of an inevitable consequence of that. So it was really nice, but in, in a way it was, my own personal feeling was less, I mean, I know Stephen was very excited about this. Yes. <laughs> my own feeling was less one of excitement and more one of relief, right? Because for me it was like, well, because the Einstein equations are such a, such a natural set of constraints to impose. Yeah. If it turned out that they were that they corresponded to an extremely unnatural set of restrictions yeah. on Wolfram model rules, that would have been for me a very very bad sign for the plausibility of the model. Yes. So it was more a relief that like a priori one would hope that if this is a plausible model then the set of restrictions should be fairly natural and, and, and limited and they were fairly natural and limited so it was more like oh yeah okay fine. Things worked out as they should do whereas if it had gone differently I would have been much more concerned. So yeah it was it was definitely a feeling of yeah, my, my, my overwhelming emotion was, was relief <laughs> rather than elation. It's funny. I find this extremely compelling. It's not a way to prove that the hypergraph model is the way to go, but it's an absolute minimum. I mean, hypergraphs have got to be able to generate relativity, otherwise they, they don't model our universe, and so they're, they're not a promising way forward for physics. But the fact that they are is, is still, in my mind, extremely compelling. And I, I find it hard to communicate this to people, perhaps because it's a little bit technical, a little bit mathematical, it's hard to communicate to people what a significant result this is. Well, it's, it's an interesting question, actually, how, how significant a result it is, because it's, and again, maybe this is, the, this is probably related to the whole bottom-up, top-down dichotomy we were talking about earlier, but the fact that the Einstein equations are such a natural feature in these models, you can interpret, I think, in one of at least two ways. One thing you could do is say, well, therefore, our models, these models are definitely capturing some really fundamental feature of reality. Yeah. which I think is the view that Stephen takes. Right. I'm not so dogmatic, but yeah. it's possible. The other position, which is maybe more aligned with how I think, is that it's really telling us that actually general relativity is not very special, if you like. Yeah. It's a question which 10 years ago or something, one would have said definitely belonged squarely within the domain of philosophy. This question of how special are the laws of physics? If you imagine the space of all possible mathematically consistent or computationally consistent universes, are laws like general relativity or quantum mechanics or quantum field theory or particle physics, are these theories very peculiar to our physical universe or are they somehow generic to a very large collection of possible universes? Yeah. That might have been an interesting question to kind of speculate about metaphysically, but it certainly didn't seem like a, a, like a well-defined scientific question. Now, we actually have, I think, a well-defined scientific apparatus to address those questions. So in a sense, the, the conclusion is that at least if you parameterize the space of possible universes as the space of possible hypergraphy writing rules, what you learn is that actually general relativity is extremely generic. Yeah. You might naively have hoped that the condition that our universe obeys GR might be enough to like nail down, maybe not exactly yeah. what the universe is, but maybe a small collection of them. But it's not, right? There are, there are huge numbers of yeah. them that all satisfy the Einstein equations. Another conclusion that you, could, you can draw from that, and a conclusion you can draw from similar discoveries we've made about the genericity of quantum mechanics, is that maybe the most fundamental theories of physics we have are actually not that peculiar to our universe. They are yeah. somehow very generic features of a large collection of these models. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thanks for listening to The Last Theory. Join me for fresh insights into Wolfram physics every other week. Subscribe to the free newsletter, podcast or YouTube channel 
at lasttheory.com. After all, this might be the most fundamental scientific breakthrough of our time.